Hello viewers, my name is Chase Clover and this is <clears throat> my USW Wednesday Night Intensity May 6th 2015 review. My one word to describe intensity from last night has to be tainted. The reason why I choose the word tainted is because this was considered the setup for Tap Out 2015, which is their next pay per view, all submission themed. Um, however, it was not just the setup for Tap Out, it was also the f aftermath or the fallout of No Remorse. Now, if you watched my No Remorse review, or even if you saw the title of it, you would know that I thought it was a bad show. The first actually really bad pay-per-view I've seen in a long time. Or at least from USW. Now, you have Intensity being put out as the first show made by USW after a bad pay-per-view and it sets up a pay-per-view that can either be bad or good right now the match card looks alright but the problem that I had with intensity last night was that it was also considered the fallout from No Remorse and that kind of taints it for me a little bit because it's got it's got that clean thing to it so it's even if it were a great show it's still pretty tainted from being the first show after a really really bad pay-per-view um, and some people disagreed some people thought it was a good pay-per-view some people thought it was a great pay-per-view but I thought it was a bad pay-per-view in terms of the matches were just put together, there was no real story behind it, there was no hype to it, and the matches really didn't make sense. And you kind of got that last night, when it came to Intensity, because, I mean, if you think about it, all they really did on Intensity was build up the same, pay the same feuds from No Remorse for Tap Out. And I had a problem with the feuds from No Remorse, because they were just put together. I mean, that problem could be solved now that there is more time to hype up the matches and give more story behind it. But you, but Intensity did not really do that. Did not give me that feeling. And I'm sad to say, but I'm not really looking forward to Tap Out. I mean, there are some... Spots on the card that I'm looking forward to, I guess. Um, I guess I'm looking forward to Seth and Alexander Rotten. Um, Dwayne Porter and Western Light, which I will get to in a little while. Dustin Raymond and Cannon. And maybe Washington versus um, Morbid. So, without further ado... Let's get into the review. We open up the show with Dustin Raymond going out to the ring and complaining to everyone that Cannon screwed him out of winning his championship back at New Remorse 2015, being as Cannon got, um, or Cannon gave Dustin Raymond the win via disqualification. However, Dustin Raymond could not retain it or could not get the title back because it cannot change hands on a disqualification or a count out. So, I mean, technically he does have a point. Cannon kind of kept him from winning the title, and he was about to win the title as well, so you know, at least they've got that, you know, having logic behind it. Uh, Curry's came out and tell it told uh, Dustin Raymond that if he wants a shot at the USW Championship, he must win a Battle Royal match in the main event to become the new number one contender for the USW Championship at Tap Out. Raymond accepts and walks away. Um, so you end up getting a battle royal late in the night, which featured um, 
Dustin Raymond, Western Light, Mojigata, BP Fierce, Morbid, and Washington. So after the opening promo, you had the first match, which was Simon Saint, the the uh, well Simon Saint and Gringo defeating the Blue Belt Champion Yo Yo Joe and International Champion Ash. Um, the ending was Simon Saint hitting Yo Yo Joe with the Blue Belt Championship while the referee was not looking, and Gringo hit the uh, I believe the Enzigiri in the back of his head and covered Yo Yo Joe for the win. And then Gringo turned heel and attacked Ash because uh, of taking the International Championship away from him. Alright, a few things I need to say about this one. One, I still don't like the idea of Yo-Yo Joe versus Simon Saint. Or Yo-Yo Joe being the Blue Belt Champion, period. The problem... I don't really have a problem with the Gringo and Ash International Championship storyline because I feel it's it's a little different. It's kind of like a blue versus green, but this kind of mixes together. Um, and now that you have Gringo turning heel, I think it brings out a little bit more character in him. You know, I mean, he was of course a heel with Fernandez and the tag team, um, and being in their tag team, he kind of had to share the spotlight as a heel. With Fernandez and Fernandez got more notice or mo no more nobility no notability or nobility whatever. Um, so Gringo kind of should stood in, in the shadows, and now Gringo's heel again. So hopefully he will be able to be a good heel character, but in my opinion. I think it can work unless somehow, some way, he gets thrown into a bad storyline that he cannot really work with. Um, and that's my fear. I think this Gringo vs. Ash match at Tapa, which of course is going to happen, especially after the promo, um, as well as Simon saying Yeah, yeah Joe, but I think the Gringo vs. Ash match should be the last in the series, and I think, you know. It looks as though Ash is going to win the title and retain. Um, so, there's my uh, thought on that. Um, uh, Simon Saint, of course, using heel tactics and hitting Yo Yo Joe with the Blue Belt Championship. Um, and before Yo Yo Joe, or before Gringo turned heel, it kind of looked like they were teasing it for a short, short time when he distracted the referee. Um, in order to let Simon Saint hit Yo Yo Joe in the head with a blue belt championship. So that was, you know, a nice touch and kinda of put a little bit of a cherry on top to Gringo's heel turn. Before the young before the ice cream of the whipped cream came along. Uh afterwards we had an interview with Fernandez about how he felt about his loss to Capital and No Remorse. He said he will pretty he pretty much said he will avenge his loss and take tap capital out and um make sure that he is not a problem he has to deal with. So, whatever. Uh, his mic skills were alright, you know, decent, average. Uh, and you don't really see in a, interviews with these mid-carders too often. Um, Fernandez, you know, it was a little bit of a change in things, so he was alright. Second match on the card was Capital and Titanfall. Capital beat Titanfall. He won after he hit the capital punishment on Titanfall and covered him for the win. Afterwards, Fernandez came out and started to attack Capital and grabs weapons to beat Capital down with. He then challenged Capital to a weapons match at Tap Out. Um, for those of you who don't know what a weapons match is, it was a match created by Zach Hardy where there are weapons, all sorts of weapons, um, scattered throughout the ring, you know, in the ring, outside the ring, it, you know, you could find a chair just laying in the ring or laying on the entrance ramp, you know, a couple kendo sticks in the ring or alongside the ringside. You can find the leg to a, you know, rainbow and Flanagan table, you know, just laying there. You can find an office chair. It's just random, everyday foreign objects that you just scatter around. Like, you just pick it and throw it. Like, you're on the entrance ramp and you're walking down, you just throw it around. That's what a weapons match is, and anything there, any weapons, not doesn't have to just be the ones that are to your, you know, disposal. Could be from under the ring, could be from, you know, what fans give you. Um, that's a weapons match. It's pretty much a notice qualification match with weapons all around you. Weapons galore. 
Um, and of course, Capital doesn't accept at that point in time because he is pretty much unconscious at that time. Um, my thought on that is I'm upset that we're going to have another Capital and Fernandez match. I guess it gives Capital something to do until another feud, you know, cancels out and we end up getting, um, a Capital versus whoever match. So I guess it's alright in the sense that it gives Capital something to do while he waits for another, you know, match to come out. But that still doesn't mean that I like it. And I don't like it. It's... You know, I don't think... Fernandez and Capital mix as a feud. Maybe if one, maybe if Cap Fernandez got a character revamp, or a character in general, maybe I could see it working. But right now, I just see it as one of those, you know, first matches on the pay per view. You know, a kickoff match or the second match or the you know, third match, whatever. But whatever. I believe you're gonna get Titanfall versus James, and supposedly James is supposed to start. You know, becoming, you know, the Enigma character from last year. Um, all vivid and dark and twisted and all that. Um, and apparently Seth, the world champion, is supposed to as well. It's kind of be, he's going to be kind of a uh, similar character to Finn Balor from the WWE NXT branch. Um, where he has face paint all over him. He's got, like, you know, flames or whatever. And just really weird, crazy, like, you know, sinister paint, around, you know, on him. So... That should be interesting, you know, from his latest photo shoot that you end up seeing, that you ended up getting, um, but it was alright, it was cool, um, yeah, that's it, um, afterwards we got our third match, which was the number one contenders match for the USW Tag Team Championships, the Martin Brothers defeated Case, um, uh, Alex hit the unique win on Amol and covered him for the win. Afterwards, Ezra and Hills and Benny Franklin walked out and cut a promo on how they will defeat the Martin Brothers at Tap Out because they are the tag team in Ultimate Showcase Wrestling. I liked this <clears throat> because you have Ezra and Hills and Benny Franklin, of course, the best tag team you have right now. You know, better than the Martin Brothers, better than Switchblade and Blade, better than Case, better than Rainy and Standard, better than Indigo Reaction. These guys just know how to hold these tag team titles and make them feel relevant. So, I liked it, and of course you're gonna you're gonna have a great tag team defending the tag team titles against another great tag team. So you have, you know, Ezra and Kills and Manny Franklin versus Alex Martin and George Martin. So two great tag teams. You know, they should mix up well together, and I'm looking forward to the match at Tap Out. I don't know what the stipulation is going to be if there is going to be one, but I know it will probably work out for them. Um, fourth match on the card was Anarchy beating Crimson Red after he hit the chaos on him and pinned him for the win. Uh, afterward, well, I'm sorry. Um, I guess what we're gonna see, well, I guess this was the final match we had between Anarchy and Crimson Red because we had it on intensity, unless I, someone challenges somebody else to, you know, a match at the next pay per view like USW likes to do. Um,. My thoughts on this, I don't really have too many thoughts other than I don't like the rivalry. I feel as a Anarchy is this kind of blue and red mixture, and Crimson Red is a red and silver mixture, and it kind of feels like, hmm, blue belt championship picture versus extreme championship picture. You know, Anarchy was in the blue belt title picture, he held that up. And Crimson Red was in the extreme title picture, and he held that up. So it's kind of like two worlds that didn't mix together. You know, Blue Belt title, extreme title, both minor titles, but they did not mix well together at all. One was supposed to be some kind of hardcore stipulation title, and the other was supposed to be, you know, the bigger, you know, better, more aimed towards um, minor championship for, you know, elevated mid-carders. Um... I don't really have much to say on this, except it's just not a mixture I would like to see. Afterwards, we had an interview with Weston Light about his about him talking on his chances of winning the USW Championship No. 1 Contenders Battle Royal match later in the night, which ended up becoming a pinfall and submission Battle Royal match. So, not over the top rope. I guess they just had to fill air time, since they only had six matches on the card. Um, 
Wesley Knight, of course, he's great on the microphone. He was very um, clear and got straight to the point. Um, you know, so he said, "I like my chances. I've got a one in I've got one in six chances. I've got a one in six percent chance of winning this match and going on to tab out for the USW Championship." I like my odds, I've always liked my odds, I've always liked them stacked against me, and I've always liked them stacked in my favor. So it really doesn't impact me whether I'm in the majority or in the minority, because I always find a way to come out strong and to make sure that I make my presence known. So, and yes, that was his quote, because I'm reading it straight from my notebook, or my job book, whatever you call the um, computer. Um... So that was great. Uh, fifth match was Lane defeating Greyhound. Um, as he hit the fast lane on Greyhound and pinned him for the win, Greyhound then got on the microphone and challenged Lane to a submission match at tap out, which Lane accepted. Um, this will probably, will, will more than likely be their final match um, at tap out, of course, um, because they had this match between Lane and Greyhound, and. They had it on intensity now, and so it seems like three strikes, and you know, you know, the feud has three strikes, and then it's done. Three strikes, and then you're, and then you're great. But this feud has three strikes, and then you're, um, you're put into different feuds. And I think this will be the third strike, and I don't think this should go on for a fourth, a fourth match. My problem with this whole, um, deal with Lane and Greyhound. Don't get me wrong, it's not bad. It's not, like, terrible, but this match on Intensity went on way longer than it needed to. This went on for about 10 to 15 minutes. It should have been a 5 to 6 minute match only. Um, they should not have had all of this time to, you know, fight and, you know, have this match, because it just, it did not do anything for them in the end, and I don't think the match at Tabo will either. Um, and it seems like both of these performers are going to be out of USW by the end of the year, so, you know, just have them wrestle on house shows for the rest of the, uh, their time in USW. So, that's all I have to say. Um, yeah. Afterwards, we had an interview with Capital about where he, or where he accepts Fernandez's challenge for Tabo, you know, now that he's conscious. Um, and he was very angry, you know, he held that, that, um, very fueled, boiling over the top anger, angry character, um, that he has in the ring, and he brought that to the microphone, so that was great, and he, you know, spoke clearly, he didn't really, um, go into vivid detail, but he did use logic, um, which is something I like hearing, um, uh, and he's all right. He, I mean, he's all right in the microphone. There's no doubt in that. But all I really need for Capital to do is to get that one little niche that he's missing, and then he'll be great to go, and he'll be, you know, the next USW champion. I don't know what that niche is, but I do know that when he finds it, he'll run with it, and he'll take it to places that he's never taken it before. Or taken it before. So, after that, uh, we had Seth going to the ring and telling Alexander Rotten that he won the match at No Remorse Fairly, which Alexander, Alexander Rotten walks down to confront. Uh, Rotten tells Seth that he feels as though it would be unfair to Seth to challenge him to a submission match for the World Heavyweight Championship, so he would give Seth another way to win by making the match a knockout match, which means you can win by submission, knockout, or not being able to, or, uh, I guess, your hand touching the mat, you know, three times, which signifies that you've passed out, or last man standing rules. So, those are your chances, um, or ten count match rules. Um, Seth accepts the offer against his better judgment and gets dropped immediately by a Samoan drop. Uh, Rotten walked away with a smile, knowing that he'd pretty much just suckered Seth into a match for the World Heavyweight title at tap out. Um, I like this feud. I like where they're going with it. I like the combination of Seth and Alexander Rodden. Seth being that, you know, that arrogant, you know, annoying piece of shit as, you know, 
the world champion and having Alexander Rotten, the big heavy guy who is, you know, towering over um, Seth in weight and height and all of that and power and strength and being, you know, the fan's hero, the one who want, who's trying to dethrone the world champion and take him off of his throne in order to get the world heavyweight championship back to him to back for himself. Um I like this. The problem I had with this was now of course this is you're supposed to play along but you know I'm a wrestling reviewer so it's kind of my job. Um at least I like to think of it as my job. Um but there was really no need for Seth to go down to the ring because if you think about it Seth walked down to the ring he said he won the match at No Remorse, and that's it. That's all he was going to do. So it didn't make sense, and it was pretty obvious at that point in time where he was just gloating. It was pretty obvious that Alexander Rodden was going to come out and challenge him to a match, and then they were probably going to brawl, and that's exactly what happened. So very predictable when it comes to these kinds of things. So USW needs to, you know, be sure to look out and... Um, Make sure they throw a curveball every once in a while if they're going to go to this type of thing, you know, rarely or occasionally or often, whatever. Um, that's what my, you know, um, offer is, or whatever, or my suggestion. So, whatever. Uh, six match on the card, main event time, number one contenders, battle royal match for the US. Number, number one contenders, battle royal match to become, or, <laughs> sorry. The Battle Royal match, pinfall and submission Battle Royal match to become the new number one contender for the USW Championship. Western Light defeated Dustin Raymond, Mojigeta, BP Fierce, Morbid, and Washington. I believe the first person eliminated was BP Fierce. I believe he was pinned by Morbid. And then afterwards, um, Mojigeta tried to hit Washington with the decapitator on the outside. However... Uh, Washington ducked and uh, BP Fierce hit him with the spin doctor, which is a spinning clothesline, and Washington covered him for the win, or covered him for the pinfall. Um, I believe then you had Morbid hitting the pile driver on Washington and pinning him for the win, and then you had Dustin Raymond hit a blue bomb up, power bomb on Morbid. And then get hit with the cannonball backflip by Cannon. So that ended up leading to uh, Western Light pinning Dustin Raymond and eliminating him. So once again, Cannon screws Dustin Raymond out of a chance at the USW Championship, which just further signifies the Dustin Raymond Cannon uh, match and tap out, even if you didn't think so before. That's exactly what's going to happen. And, um,. Then it was Morbid and Western Light, and I believe the rest went as though you would think. However, the ending of the match was Morbid tried to hit a pile driver on Washington or on Western Light through the commentator's table, so he got on the chair. Western Light got out of the or the choke slam, and uh, Western Light got out of the choke slam, and Morbid stood on the chair while Western Light stood on the announce table, and Western Light put Morbid through the table with the lantern and covered him for the win. So Western Light becomes a new Demon contender for the USW Championship. And the show ends with Dwayne Porter coming down to the ring and uh, having a face-to-face -face with Western Light as a preview for what we're going to see in four weeks at Tap Out 2015. So that was intensity. Um, it was it was an alright show. It was a pretty good show. Um, there were, of course, the things that I said I didn't like about it. You know, the length of the lane versus Greyhound match, um, the uh, Anarchy Crimson Red swirl that I didn't really like. Um, you know, Capital and Fernandez having those few, you know segments and everything. Um, the tag team match, the Simon Saint Gringo versus Yo Yo Joe and Ash match. I mean, that the match itself was not bad. It's just you know the people it featured didn't feel like the right fit. Um, and made it only further, you know, more revealing, or whatever. And that's pretty much what I didn't like. Um, of course, like I said at the beginning of the review, I felt as though it was, t the show was tainted because of the, um, fact that it was a fallout for No Remorse, but 
you know, now it seems like you're going to get quite a few of those matches from No Remorse that were just put together, you know, at the last minute to fill in space time for the pay-per-view. Um, however, now I think, well, I think that they have enough time now to really get themselves the storylines and really get the storylines to, you know, going or whatever. And I hope this serves as a lesson to USW to make sure that your events or your pay-per-views um, or your feuds are held, that are held, you know, at a pay-per-view the week before another pay-per-view continue into the next pay-per-view so that way you don't have to fill in all this air time. I get it with Cold Greatness 10 because you couldn't really have repeats of those feuds, but, you know, just look out for that in the future. Um, anyway, good show. Um, I don't know whether to look forward to Tap Out or whether to just keep my eye open for whatever pops out at Tap Out, but, you know, whatever goes on, I, I'm hoping for the best. So, thank you guys for watching. That was my review of the Wednesday Night Intensity May 6th, 2015 edition. Uh, remember to like, favorite, and subscribe for more. I'm Chase Clover, signing off.